bridge. Uh, yes, all right. Um, so I'm joining you here from the United States and I am located right here in the middle of the US. So right now here, it's uh, seven o'clock in the morning. So that's why my room is still a little dark. Um, so just to let you know where I'm, uh, I'm located. So I'm in a town called Columbia, Missouri at the University of Missouri, which, is, which looks like this. And this is the first time I'm participating in this, uh, in this school. And I am, uh, you know, uh, I thank you for, for the invitation to participate. And I hope that um, you will find this lecture useful. So here's a brief outline of what I'm planning to do in the next uh, perhaps 45 minutes or so. Um, so I will start with a brief recap of Cone Sham DFT. And of course, from previous lectures, you have already heard uh, you know, the basic framework. And I'll talk about the strategies for approximating exchange correlation functionals. I'll talk about GGAs. And then all of this is a recap of, of uh, uh, things of material that you have already heard before. But I suppose it doesn't harm to hear certain things more than once. Then we'll talk about meta GGs, hybrid functionals, and a little bit beyond. I'll show you some examples. And hopefully, all of this will be useful and uh, teaches you something about DFT. So, if anyone has questions during my talk, please do not hesitate to interrupt. There's no problem. Otherwise, you can ask your questions later. So, let's start. So, density functional theory. Um, is uh, a reformulation of many body theory entirely in terms of the probability density. So the great thing is that the many body wave function, which is uh, a complicated object, is no longer the center of the theory. You don't try to do, you don't try to calculate this thing, but instead it's only the one body density, which is a function of one variable and which is much simpler to calculate. So all of this was uh, in essence invented by Walter Kohn. And um, to make all of this work in practice, you have to work, or we usually work with the Kohn sham theory. So with the Kohn sham equations. And in essence, what you do is you solve the equation that's here in this yellow box, which is an equation which is a single particle Schrodinger equation. So you, you, you solve for these single electron orbitals. And the Hamiltonian has, uh, in addition to the external potential, which could be the potential of the nuclei, it has a Hartree and an exchange correlation potential. Now, these two depend on the density as input. The density is obtained from the orbital. So you have to solve this whole equation self consistently. The exchange correlation potential itself is formally defined as a functional derivative of the exchange correlation energy EXC. So this EXC, if, it, if this is known, you can get the VXC. We'll talk about that in a second. And once you are done with solving all this, so for example, you are, you are finished running quantum espresso or whatever code you have, you can, for example, calculate the total ground state energy. And you get this. There's a formula here. You get this from the, from the epsilons. And then there's additional terms. There's a Coulomb interaction term. And then two terms that depend on exchange and correlation. And if you knew what the exact functional was, then the ground state energy would be exact. So now that's in a nutshell, what you do in DFT. But the problem, of course, is we don't know what the exchange correlation functional is. So what is it, really? In a sense, the exchange correlation functional is like a library where you have many, many books. And for any given n of r, you can go to the library, to you know, the, the shelf that corresponds to that density. 
and you can look up what the EXC is. So that's in essence what a functional is. It's like a big library. But of course, what the hohenberg cohn theorem or what the basic theorems of DFT guarantee is that this library exists. But unfortunately, the library is locked, so we can't get in. We don't have access to it. Um, because that would have implied that we had solved the exact many body problem for all possible uh, densities, and that is not, not, not feasible. So, okay, instead we have to approximate. And of course, there are literally hundreds of exchange correlation functionals that have been developed over the years. The question is, where do these come from? And what do they do? And how do we use them? So we'll talk about a few of those today. You've heard or already about things like LDA, LSDA, PBE. I will say a few more words of the, about those and then we go a little further. So for example, we talk about B3LIP a little bit today. So what are then the strategies? So as I said before, the exact exchange correlation functional would require solving the many body problem. That cannot be done in general, can only be done for extremely simple toy models that are not really useful in practice. So instead, we have to find approximations. And to do that, there are two avenues that are available to us. So we can do it empirically or non-empirically. An empirical approximation basically uses fitting parameters and the non-empirical approximation does not. It uses exact constraints and conditions. There is also mixtures. So in, in practice, uh, there are many so-called semi-empirical functionals that use one or two parameters, but also exact conditions and constraints. So both all of these philosophies have been very successful and you will, you will see examples of both type of functionals and the following. So what are examples for some of those constraints? Um, so first of all, if we have slowly varying densities, if you have a density that is almost, or that is constant or almost constant, then it should reduce to the limit of the homogeneous electron gas. So that is one exact condition because the homogeneous electron gas is a system that we can solve exactly, at least numerically exactly. Here's another constraint, the asymptotic behavior. If you have a finite system such as an atom or a molecule, and you go far away from that system, so R going to infinity, then we know that the exact exchange correlation potential must go like minus one over R. That's important too. That constraint is related to uh, the so-called self-interaction of freedom. So the exact exchange correlation functional cannot have self-interaction in it. So that means a system cannot interact with itself. And one way of formulating this is to say that in the limit where you have only one electron, the exact exchange correlation potential must behave like, or must reduce to minus n over r minus r prime, d r prime, so minus, so that cancels the Hartree potential for one electron. There are many more constraints that I will not list here. So that have to do, for example, with the gradient expansion, certain scaling relations and, and others, uh, which however are important and have been used extensively. So we'll come back to this. Now, here is an image that you have probably heard before as well. So there is this so-called Jacob's ladder, which is a way of thinking about functionals in, in a density functional theory. Now this whole, this image, which I took from Wikipedia, comes uh, at least the way uh, it is introduced here. It, it, it's a biblical image where um, there was a dream where 
uh, it was shown that there is a ladder that goes all the way from, from the earth all the way to heaven. Now, interestingly, this image is also known to other cultures. So I have seen, for example, uh, similar, uh, very similar images in India and elsewhere. So it is pretty much a universal way of thinking. Um, and it has been helpful for DFT because the way we think about this in this context is to say that, well, Earth, that's uh, sort of the, the, the lowest level, is where we have no exchange and correlation at all. So that is the Hartree world only. In between, as you climb up the ladder, if you go higher and higher, that means the approximations become better and better. And if you reach heaven, which of course you cannot really because it would be solving the exact problem, that would be the exact functional. So we think in terms of this, uh, this ladder of approximations. So here is a somewhat uh, more, um, you know, a, a somewhat more reduced um, schematic representation of this letter. <clears throat> so as we said, down here at the bottom is uh, the approximation where we would have no exchange and correlation at all. Then the first rung, the first step is the local density approximation, the LDA. And I believe you heard about that yesterday, perhaps even before that. The second, second step are the gradient approximations, the GGAs. The third step are the meta GGAs. So we will, I will tell you about those today. Also about the hybrid functionals, which are on the fourth step. Then step number five are the so-called RPA-like functionals. And then up here in this cloud, is the exact function, which of course, as I said, is not known. So as you go up, the functionals become in a sense more complicated. There are more building blocks. The computational cost in general increases. So in other words, your calculations will take longer and may require more resources. But the results are better, generally speaking. So uh, you have to decide then how many resources you can expend and uh, what kind of accuracy you would like to achieve. So let's talk about a little bit. Uh, so to understand the classification of these different functionals, it is useful to think for a moment about the meaning of the words local and non-local, local, local semi-local and non-local. So um, to explain this, let us think about a system. So you see this, this cloud here, this, this blob, which is, um, um, you can think of like as, a, as the electron cloud in an atom, all right? And the exchange correlation energy, EXC, is defined as the integral over the little EXC. Little EXC is the exchange correlation energy density. So it is a function of space. And when you integrate over it, you get the exchange correlation energy. So now in a local functional, the EXC uh, is a function of R, but it depends only on the density at the same point R. Okay, so it depends only on the density at the same point R. So that is a local function. And by contrast, there are semi-local functionals where the exchange correlation energy density depends on the density and orbitals in a little neighborhood of that point. So uh, in practice, that means it depends on the density or of the, on the, of the or and densities or orbitals at point R and their gradients. So you need a little bit of information, not just at that point R, but also in a small neighborhood. And finally, um, a non-local functional depends on the density 
for the orbitals everywhere. So you need information about um, the entire system when you work out when you when you construct exc at point r. So local functionals are the easiest, and semi-local and non-local functionals are more complicated. Now I don't know if you all see this red line here. I don't know why that came in. So I will just continue. Um, <clears throat> so let us uh, move on. So again, we have the Jacobs ladder here. And now you see each of these steps has now been assigned the label local, semi-local or non-local. So you see the LDA is local functional. GGA and meta, meta GGA are semi-local functionals. And hybrids and RPA-like functionals are non-local. So you see local, semi-local, non-local means it becomes more complicated. And here you can also see the building blocks that go into these functionals. So the LDA only depends on the local density. The, the GGA have gradients of the densities. The meta GGAs can have the Laplacians. It can also have the tau. I'll show you later what that is. That's the kinetic energy density. Hybrids have the exchange. And RPA functionals have unoccupied orbitals. So let's talk about, um, let's take a few minutes to review gradient approximations. So formally, one can write the uh, one can write down a Taylor expansion of the exchange correlation energy density. You can write that as exc zero plus exc one exc two, where exc zero, the zeroth order term, has no gradients, and that is the local approximation. Exc one contains first order gradients of the density, and exc two contains second order gradients. So that means either second derivative or the gradient of n squared, and so on. So formally, you can do that. And we, in fact, know what these terms are. But it turns out, unfortunately, that this is not a really good idea in the sense that when you try and do that, and then you put it in your computer and you run calculations, the results are really bad. Um, it doesn't improve the LDA and often makes things worse. The ultimate reason for that is, is uh, one of mathematics, because this is an asymptotic series and it, um, it has trouble converging. So in practice, one does uh, different things. Um, so um, what one does in practice, and that is an idea that has been around for 30 years and more, one develops so-called generalized gradient approximations, where basically what you do is you say, OK, I define an exchange correlation energy, which contains the densities, and here the spin up and spin down densities, and their gradients. And I define this using certain known constraints and perhaps some empirical parameters. And I optimize it <coughs> as best as I can. So there are empirical and non-empirical GGAs. So this idea has been around for many years, has been extremely successful, and I'll show you a couple of examples now. So the first example is the blip or blip functional. And I just show you because this is not something you should memorize, but just so you have seen these, what these functionals look like because they are built into many codes. So for example, there is the Becker 88 exchange functional, which is the LDA, plus a term here that looks like that. So there is an empirical parameter here. So you see it's a semi, it's an empirical functional. And this quantity x is uh, the gradient divided by the density to the power of 4 thirds. No, that doesn't look so complicated. Uh, there is a, the matching correlation functional is called the Li, Yang, and Par functional, which is also from 1988. It looks like this. It has a bunch of parameters, A, B, C, D. So it is also an empirical functional. 
and it contains there is a second order gradient here. Um, there is a T sub W that is the first order gradient. So you see it's a gradient corrected functional. And it looks it's not that complicated, but um, um, you know, you don't really want to do functional derivatives of this thing. So putting these two together gives you the B lip functional. Then of course, um, the PBE functional, which certainly you have heard about. So that's a functional that was developed by John Perdue, Kieran Burke, and Matthias Ernsterhoff in, in 1996. So that has been around for 25 years now. And by now, it is the most widely used functionals. And if you go to Google Scholar, you will discover that this paper, the original paper has over 130,000 citations. So has been extremely, has made an extremely high impact. And here's what it looks like. So the exchange part looks like this. So it has a couple of parameters, the kappa and the beta, though they are not empirical, they're not fitting parameters. Kappa and beta are determined from first principles. S is a quantity that contains the gradient of the density. And from this, you can also, you can also make the spin dependent using the so-called Oliver Purdue spin scaling. That's not important right now, but um, this is an entirely non-empirical function. There's a correlation part. The correlation part looks like this. And again, it has a few numbers. There is a quantity A, C naught, uh, these are again not empirical parameters, but these are determined from first principles. <clears throat> so, um, taken together, then, so the EX plus the EC is the PBE exchange correlation functional. And that is a functional that is, for instance, built into quantum espresso, and it is built in essence into every DFT code that is nowadays being used. And I will show you results in just a little bit. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to get uh, another bit of theory out of the way. <clears throat> so let's move on right away to the so-called meta GGAs. So the meta GGAs contain yet another building block. So they contain, while well, they contain the Laplacian of the density, the second derivative, Strictly speaking, some of the GGAs have that also built in. Um, just, a, just a practical remark. Um, in practice, the Laplacian of the density is sometimes a little problematic numerically because um, the, the, the electron density close to a nucleus has a cusp. So for example, if you have a diatomic molecule, then the density will have a peak in the vicinity of the nucleus. So, so there is a sharp spike. And when you calculate the second derivative of that, that spike would be, um, would, uh, would be discontinuous. So with an all electron theory, it's a bit problematic. With pseudo potentials, of course, all of this is not an issue. <clears throat> the other thing here, the tau, is the kinetic energy density. So the way this is defined as you take the gradient of the orbitals, you square that and you sum over all the orbitals. So that's the tau and that, that part. Is okay. <clears throat> so the question is then, what is it? How is that useful? So why should one add the kinetic energy density? Well, there are, Reasons for that, it turns out that the kinetic energy density is sensitive to the degree of localization of the electrons. So that it helps us to this, it helps to distinguish covalent single bonds and metallic bonds. And it also incorporates, it helps us to incorporate additional exact constraints of one and two electron densities. So in other words, having this additional building block in functionals uh, makes them a little more sensitive and helps us to, in, to build in more exact conditions. So what is there in the literature? And again, 
John Perdue has been uh, the pioneer for all of this. So there is an early meta GGA, which is called TPSS from 2003. And there's a more recent meta GGA that's called SCAN, S-C-A-N, which stands for strongly constrained, appropriately normed. And I will tell you a little bit about that because SCAN satisfies all of the 17 known exact conditions that a meta GGA can satisfy. It is a non-empirical functional, which is from, from a physicist's point of view, quite satisfying. And it, it performs quite well. So let's look at uh, finally at a few results. So I'm going to start out by discussing this table right here, the table of numbers. And I got this table from this publication here in 2015. So let me explain what this table shows. So what the, what the authors of this paper have done is they have taken so-called molecular test, so-called test set, excuse me, test sets and databases, which are um, comp where, where people have compiled exact, uh, meaning uh, uh, high, uh, very precise experimental data for many different molecules and also solids. So you see here, uh, G3 is the name of that uh, molecular data set. G3HC are just hydrocarbons. Then BH stands for chemical barrier heights. S22 stands for certain weakly bonded complexes. And LC stands for lattice constants of um, a number of, of uh, solids. <clears throat> Okay, so these are results with which you compare your calculations. So then there's ME that stands for mean error and MAE that stands for mean absolute error. So there are lots of numbers. So let's only look at the mean absolute errors and we compare the performance of different functionals. So here's the LDA or LS local spin density approximation. Then we have three GGAs that is blip, PBE and PBE sol. PBE sol is just a slightly different variant of the PBE functional. Then we have TPSS and SCAN and MO6 uh, is an empirical functional. So let's not look at that right now. And you see here that in all of these, the SCAN functional performs the best. So LSDA, has the largest mean absolute error, then PBE reduces that error by half and SCAN reduces it further. Likewise, <clears throat> for the other indicators like barrier heights, um, the energies of weakly bonded complexes, you see here, um, SCAN performs particularly well. And even for the lattice constants of solids, the error that is made with this uh, meta GGA is the smallest, but keep in mind that PBE still performs really, really well. And I will show you more results later on. But for now, I just wanna highlight that the meta GGA scan is, is, uh, is, is successful. So for example, what is plotted here, and that's a way of plotting results that you have also seen previously where one compares computation with experiment. And if the data fall on this diagonal line, that means you're reproducing the experimental data exactly. So you would like your data to be as close as possible to this line. So this is experiment. And what this is, is the so-called formation enthalpy, which basically means the energy that is contained in one unit cell uh, of, a, of, of the crystal or per atom. So this is experiment, this is theory. And you see PBE is a little bit off from that diagonal. It's still very, very good, but not, not quite uh, on top, whereas SCAN is, is doing much better. Um, so you see here, um, one thing uh, that you would like to, so sort of one, one benchmark that is important here is the so-called chemical accuracy. And that is about 0.04 electron volts per atom. 
And it's called chemical accuracy because that is uh, basically the level of accuracy that you can obtain in, uh, in an experimental chemical characterization of, of energetics. <clears throat> so this is all very good. So scan is very close to chemical accuracy, not quite. Uh, PBE is a bit further away, but still pretty, really good. Uh, less accurate for transition metal compounds, but, but still good. To show you another example, this is um, a calculation that studies uh, water. So you take water molecules and you ask, if I take six water molecules, how will they arrange themselves? So you see here in this image, you have one, two, three, four, five, six. So do they form a ring like this? Or do they, will they arrange themselves in structures like that? Prism, cage, book, or cyclic? Um, now, all of these functions, or the, all of these structures, which are small molecules, are weakly bound because water um, forms hydrogen bonds. And there's also Van der Waals interaction. So this is medium, so-called medium range Van der Waals interaction and hydrogen bonds. These are weakly bonded systems which are challenging. And it turns out that PBE predicts the wrong structure. It predicts the prism structure, whereas the exact structure should be the, the ring. And we know this because there's a CCSD, which is a very accurate quantum chemistry calculation that predicts this structure. And the scanned functional agrees with that prediction. Um, the pink line here is the PBE function of PBE zero, which is something I'll tell you about in just a moment, plus a, an empirical Van der Waals correction, <clears throat> which also predicts the right structure. So all of that is pretty good. So now there is a little bit of a summary, what I've told you so far. <clears throat> so, we know that non-empirical exchange correlation functionals are constructed so as to satisfy certain known exact constraints. <clears throat> Following from this, the GGAs and meta-GGAs have been very successful in the sense they are reliably accurate and they can predict materials properties efficiently and, as I said, reliably. So remember, GGAs and meta-GGAs were classified as semi-local functions. So the question then is, can we sort of say when, in general, semi-local functionals are OK? So the answer is yes, there is something we can say. And that has to do with what is known as the exchange correlation hole. And I will not go into any of the mathematics here. I just want to give you a feeling for how to think about it. And the exchange correlation hole, <clears throat> the exchange correlation hole expresses ways in which electrons can avoid each other. So electrons, as you know, are negatively charged particles. So they will repel each other through Coulomb interaction. So if you have two electrons, one here and one there, they feel the classical Coulomb force. So negative and negative charge will push each other away. Uh, but, but electrons are quantum particles. So the electrons also have, there's, there's also quantum effects that cause the electrons to avoid each other. So one of them is the Pauli principle. And that is the so-called exchange interaction between parallel spins. That effect is not there for classical charges, but it is important for quantum particles. And then there's also correlation effects, uh, which is in essence, everything else besides Pauli. And that affects electrons, both parallel and anti-parallel spins. So what does that mean? And how do we have to think about that? You can think about it in, the, in a sense if you, if you take a snapshot of a configuration of a many electron system, where at a given time, the electrons, and think of them as 
electronic wave packets are more or less localized in certain places, then a given electron will have a region where it is less likely to find another electron. So a nice way to think about this in times of COVID is that electrons practice social distancing. So they don't like to have other electrons close and nearby. And some of that social distancing comes simply from classical Coulomb forces, but others, other parts of it come from exchange and correlation effects. So it is then important to get this kind of exchange correlation effect right. Um, now, the problem is that there are situations when this exchange correlation hole sometimes extends very far away from, from the electron. So sometimes this exchange correlation hole <clears throat> is just confined to a small region around the reference electron, but sometimes it can reach quite far. So semi-local functionals, then, they, will, they tend to work well whenever the exchange correlation hole is sufficiently compact and localized. On the other hand, uh, when the, the exchange correlation hole uh, extends very far away, then there are problems. And when does that happen? That happens for weakly bonded systems. It happens for strongly correlated systems. And it also uh, has to do, well, the band gap calculations now, of course, are a different story. but um, um, these two, so weakly bonded and strongly correlated systems, can be characterized through delocalized exchange correlation holes. So, in other words, we would like to do better than that. So, let's now come finally to the hybrid functionals. So, we go up another rung, we go up to step number four in the ladder and now go to non local functions. So let me explain how hybrid functionals work. Um, there is one thing that we know exactly in DFT, and that is the form of the exchange energy. So we can write down the exchange energy as a function of the cone sham orbitals, a functional, I should say. So this expression that you see here involves a sum over all the occupied orbitals in this way. When you divide by r minus r prime, you integrate over r and r prime. So this object is also called the Fock exchange. And it is, uh, um, it is what gives rise to the Hartree-Fock theory, of course. But in this case, these things are not Hartree-Fock orbitals, but they are cone sham orbitals. So we know this function exactly. Okay, wonderful. So we know something exactly. Why not use it? Um, the thing is, if we make this thing part of our theory, then we can immediately get rid of self-interaction uh, errors, at least for the exchange. And we can also immediately satisfy the requirement of the exact asymptotics. So that's fantastic. And let's see how we can do this. So. <clears throat> The first guess would be to say, all right, why not take the exact exchange energy, meaning this part right here, and combine it with LDA or GGA correlation? Then I know the exchange part exactly, and correlation, OK, fine, we approximate it. Problem is, this is very bad. This does not work. Why does this not work? The answer is uh, the answer is error cancellation. Now, in LDAs and GGAs, there is something funny going on when you look at closely at uh, the different contributions to the energy. So there is an there is an LDA exchange and there is an LDA correlation, and it turns out that both of them have errors, but the errors go in the opposite direction. So the errors tend to tend to cancel out at least partly. And this is one of the reasons why LDA and GGA work so well, <clears throat> because the errors of exchange and correlation um, tend to compensate. So we are really lucky that this is happening. So now you see what's happening in, in our guess. The exact exchange has no error, 
but the correlation has a large error, which then remains uncompensated. And therefore, the hybrid function that we construct in this way will, will not be very good. So that's disappointing, but there's a way around it. And the way around it is to say, all right, well, let's play with this a little bit and perhaps we can, we can make it better. So the idea was then to construct the hybrid functional by introducing a mixing parameter, A, which can be a number between zero and one. So we take perhaps 30% of the exact exchange and then 70% of GGA exchange plus GGA correlation. So the, fit, the parameter A can be either uh, optimized by fits to data sets. There can also be some first principles, some theoretical arguments. But in the end, what, when you do it this way, you still benefit from error cancellation, at least in part. And you also take advantage of the nice properties of the exact exchange. So if you will, this is a compromise. <clears throat> um, just, uh, I'm looking at the time. I have another 10 slides, so I will finish in another maybe five to seven minutes. Good, so let me give you a couple of examples here. So uh, one example is the PBE zero functional, which goes back to 1999. And the PBE zero is exactly a functional of this type where one takes one quarter of exact exchange, three quarters of PBE exchange and all of PBE correlation. So that's PBE zero. A little before that was the B3 lip functional, which is a functional, the three comes because we have three parameters, A, B, and C, which were fitted to a molecular data set. So you have one minus A LDA exchange, A times so, uh, 0 .0, 0 0.2 exact exchange, then a little bit of Becker 88 exchange, then a little bit of LYP correlation, and then one minus C LDA correlation. So it is a functional that mixes together different things. Um, and the mixing is optimized by fitting. So let's see how well this works. So I'm going to show you now a couple of tables in this and in the next slide. So the first table comes from chemistry. So these are calculations for molecular data sets. And again, we have uh, here total energy for, for formation enthalpy is basically total energy, ionization potential, equilibrium bond length, um, vibrational frequencies. Hartree-Fock is very bad. That is known because Hartree-Fock has no correlation and correlation is important. LDA is much better than LDN Hartree-Fock. Then the GGAs are, are better yet. And it turns out for molecules, blip is, is actually much better than PBE. So it gives much better energies. And, but the winner here is clearly the hybrid functional B3 lip. So for molecules, um, it clearly gives the best answer. I don't have any scan. I own the only meta GGA that I have here is TPSS, which is quite good, but it is not as good as B3 lip. So the numbers you see in this table are in essence, the reason why everybody in chemistry uses B3 lip. On this slide, I show you a number of a, a table that come that is relevant for solids. So this is now this is from this paper. And what you see here is <clears throat> cohesive energy and lattice constant of certain solids. Um, again, LDA is, is kind of the worst. The lattice constants of LDA are actually quite good. The cohesive energies have uh, you know, somewhat of an error. The GGAs, and here PBE is much, much better than blip. And for the hybrid functionals, PBE zero is also better. B3 lip is actually very bad for solids. So you see here, it gives terrible energies. The lattice constants are worse than, than LDA. Uh, SCAN is here the winner, but PBE 
is in terms of energies just as good as scan. So for solids, PBE is the best you can do, really, as the best compromise. And you do not want to use B3 lips lip for solids, at least not for structures. <clears throat> so in the end, <clears throat> the message of all of this is that PBE and B3 lip are the most widely used functionals in DFT. <clears throat> And this figure that I'm showing here is from an old, well, it's a paper, it's now 10 years old. So what this shows, just to give you an impression of the, the, the number of papers that have been published over the years. So this is, <clears throat> this is year all the way to 2012. Um, this is kilo papers, meaning thousand papers. And you see here by, by the year 2010, about 10 years ago, you had almost <clears throat> 10,000 papers. And nowadays in 2021, it will be probably many, many more. So this curve has probably increased. I don't have any more recent data, but the colors show that the, the blue papers are in chemistry and they use B3lib. The green papers are in solid state physics or material science, they use PBE. And everything else, all the other papers use other kinds of functionals. So you, that tells you the significance of PBE and B3 lib for DFT and for material science and for computational electronic structure. Okay, <clears throat> here's a little bit of a summary of, um, of uh, you know, what, what I would like to say about hybrid functionals. So hybrid functionals, again, contain a fraction of Hartree-Fock exchange. The mixing parameter can be determined empirically as in B3lib or semi-empirically as in PBE0. Hybrids are non-local orbital functionals. And when you, when you actually do cone champ theory with them, um, Okay, wait, I'm just, okay, just one moment. I, I'm sorry, I was just looking at the chat and I will look at the chat and the questions in, in let, me, let me finish with, let me finish with the presentation and then I go to the chat questions. So I'm sorry. So I was saying generalized cone sham theme uh, scheme, that means when you, in practice, when you do a hybrid calculation, you have to treat the exchange similar to Hartree-Fock with a non-local exchange correlation, exchange potential. You can also alternatively solve it post-self-consistency. That means solve cone sham with LDA and GGA and plug into the orbitals. But usually the way um, these functionals are treated are using a generalized cone sham scheme. <clears throat> so, um, Hybrid functionals, how do they perform? They're very good for the energetics of molecules. They give good geometries, lattice constants, but GGA and meta-GGA are often better. Uh, Hartree-Fock exchange can be expensive for solids, depending on, uh, on the method. And they give good band gaps. So in the Remaining couple of minutes, I will just say something about band gaps. Maybe you have heard this before. So one issue that one has when one does a DFT calculation and one calculates the band structure, one usually finds using LDA or PBE that the band gap is too small. So here again is one of those plots where we, where we compare experimental band gap with calculated gap. And you see that for PBE, those are the light, the empty squares. Uh, all of the data are pretty far away from the line. So that means the band gap is too small. So for example, I don't know, gallium nitride, instead of a band gap of 3.5, it only has a band gap of two electron volts. That's too small. Uh, HSE and LC are two kinds of hybrid functionals, and you see that they perform much better. So HSE gives us really good band gaps for uh, semiconductors. 
LC gives us good, good band gaps for covalent and ionic solids. Here's another set of data. Um, for example, PBE0 gives us good band gaps. Um, and there's other ways in which you can construct functionals, hybrid functionals that give good band gaps across the board. <clears throat> so, well, the problem is, of course, hybrid functionals are expensive. You have to think twice before you run them for, for solid states. Okay, I'm almost done. The only thing that is left to do is now to, uh, <clears throat> to ask, well, how about going even higher up on the ladder? So, so far we talked about local, semi-local functionals, hybrids. So now the last ladder, that's the step number five, um, are the so-called RPA type functionals. So these things, I will not show you formulas. These things are complicated and they, they depend not only on the occupied, but also on the unoccupied orbitals. They are highly non-local. So that means they involve complicated integrals. Um, and of course, they tend to give good results. So for example, if you have certain types of correlation, that is difficult to describe using all the other functionals. Um, things like phenomena like screening, dissociation of molecules, um, weak bonds, dispersion interactions, that means Van der Waals type interactions, all of those things can be very well described using these RPA type functionals, which is great. Unfortunately, that's computationally expensive. So um, these type of functionals up here are not really mainstream. They, are, they can be used for materials, but these calculations are only uh, usually only done by specialists. There are some alternatives. If you are interested in these kind of complicated effects, so for example, Van der Waals interactions can be put in by hand. These are so-called dispersive corrections. If you are doing calculations in chemistry, you will often use these dispersion corrections that works quite well, but that's empirical. If you are a solid state physicist, you may want to do something that's called LDA plus U. <coughs> this is something that helps shift, uh, open up the band gap and describe strongly correlated materials better. Or even better, uh, you can use so-called quasi-particle based theories or many body based theories such as GW. And I believe you will hear about GW more next week. These things are extremely good for band gaps, um, but they are also expensive. Um, now, quasi-particle based theories are not part of the, of the Jacobs ladder here. Um, it's, a different kind of, it's a different kind of theory. And, um, but of course, you know, it, is, it is somewhat expensive. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up. Uh, by thanking you for your attention. So I'm just wrapping up with a couple of pretty pictures that were done using DFT. And um, I think now we can go ahead and look at questions. And I can see here that there were a few things going on in the scan, so in the, in the chat. So I don't know how should we proceed. Um...